church leaders, give us wisdom, give us a true vision, give us compassion, give us consistency, give us insight into the needs of the hour, and tailor our preaching and our ministry to the needs of the hour, so that we will speak directly and clearly and loudly and also we trust warmly with gospel warmth and gospel clarity. Mold and fashion and shape the ministry of these days so that it will be to the glory of God alone and to the good of those who listen. Remember, Lord, we pray the young life in our midst as a congregation. We give thanks, O Lord, for the birth of a little girl. We have prayed for that child. We prayed for her in the womb. We knew nothing about her, but we prayed knowing that the Lord himself knew everything about her. We pray, Lord, for them. We pray for them as a family, as parents. Help them, O Lord, and grant that she would grow up to be a daughter of the King, a child of God, one who would come not only to a first birth, but that one day she would have a second birth, that one day she would be born again and become a child of a heavenly Father. Remember the wider family. Remember, Lord, uh, others whose Situation today is not one of joy, but of sorrow. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Comfort those whose hearts are empty and whose homes are empty. And as we think of them, we think particularly of the Murray family in Brora. We give thanks, O Lord, for the ministry of Mr. Murray. For his careful, conscientious ministry and for his service in the kingdom of Christ over these years. His voice is now silent. We shall not hear it again in this world. We shall not share with him again in the work of the gospel, in the courts of the church, or even preaching here. These things are gone. But we pray, Lord, that the seed that has been sown would even now bring fruit out in the congregation in which he served and in the family. Remember, Mrs. Murray, remember the whole family. We commit them in their needs to thyself. And as we see the Lord's people taken home, we pray that others would be raised up, who would take their place, and who would take on the burdens and responsibilities that need to be shouldered. And that those who perhaps feel too weak for these things would find their strength in the Lord himself. Remember, Lord, we pray the wider needs of our day. We have prayed already for the nation. We pray particularly for our Prime Minister and our First Minister and those who govern alongside them in the great departments of state. We pray, eternal Lord, for each area and department of national life, those who serve in the health service and who must issue, wrestle with issues of morality and ethics every week of life those who serve in uh, the teaching profession, those who serve in caring for others in whatever way and level that might be. We pray, O oh Lord, that as a nation, we would have our fabric woven around the gospel. Revive thy work, O oh Lord. Restore the years that the locusts have eaten. We pray, O oh Lord, that the falsehood and the emptiness which so many cling to in these days would be seen for what it is and that they would flee to the rock that is Christ for there alone that is surety. Be with us, Lord, we pray. Lead us in worship. Cleanse us from every sin. We confess the sins of holy things, the sins of the weak, the sins of commission and the great sins of omission. All the things we have not done, not said, not thought that the law requires of us. How thankful we are tonight 
that our standing before God does not depend on our keeping of the law. If it does, we are undone. We look to Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our hope. He is our standing. And none perish that trust in him. Go before us, we pray. And assist us in all that lies before us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. going to read together now in the New Testament scriptures and in the epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. We're going to read in chapter 2. Ephesians in chapter 2 and we're going to read from the beginning of this passage. Mm. Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened, now quickened there means brought to life, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation, our lives, our lifestyle in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God hath ordained before ordained, that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh, the, the both one there refers to the Jewish and Gentile division, which before had been the great spiritual dividing line all the way through the Old Testament period. That's the great spiritual dividing line, the Jew-Gentile division. Now he says we're in New Testament days. That division is, is, is really meaningless because Jews and Gentiles together find a saviour in Christ. He is our peace, verse 14, who hath made both one. That's the two he's made one. And hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself a queen 
one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We trust the Lord to follow with his blessing the reading of his word. And we continue to read from his word, but from metrical Psalm 119. If we were singing, we would be singing these words just now. Psalm 119 from verse 156. One one nine and one five six. O Lord, both great and manifold, thy tender mercies be, according to thy judgments just, revive and quicken me. My persecutors many are, and foes that do combine, yet from thy testimonies pure, my heart doth not decline. I saw transgressors and was grieved, for they keep not thy word. See how I love thy law, as thou art kind. Me quicken, Lord. You see again that reference to the Lord's kindness. As thou art kind, me quicken, Lord. From the beginning, all thy word has been most true and sure. Thy righteous judgments everywhere, forevermore endure. Well, can we come before the Lord now in prayer? Let's pray. Our gracious God, we have read thy word. No doubt we have not read it as attentively or carefully as we should have. We confess that our minds have wandered as we've read it, and that we have not focused on it or considered it. We were urged already today to consider these things. We have not really considered it as we read it as we should have. We are familiar with this chapter. And that familiarity can be a dangerous thing. We pray, Lord, that even now as we turn to it again, we would consider it better. We would think on it more. And that it would speak to us in our soul. And that we would see Christ in the Word. And that he would be precious to us. And that he would become precious to us. And that we would see that all our hope is built only on him. Be with us. Remember those who join us electronically. And Lord, that they, they would be able to share in something of the spirit of worship. They are not here and they cannot be here physically tonight. But uh, the Lord is not limited to man-built buildings. The spirit of God is able to minister wherever there is a need. Cover us, we pray. Lead us and guide us in worship. Keep us from error. Keep us from coming 
weary under the word, drowsy under the word. Physically, yes, but spiritually as well. We can be wide awake physically, but sound asleep spiritually. Waken us and meet us in our need. And show thy kindness. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, as you will recall, we have been together on Sabbath evenings over these past five or six weeks, looking at that remarkable 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. But this evening I want to leave our studies in Matthew 24 to one side, temporarily, and turn back now to that chapter that we read together the second chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll read just now at verse 7. You notice we're cutting in here really into the middle of a sentence by the Apostle Paul. Verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I suspect if I were to add up the number of times I've preached from this chapter in the last 10 years, let alone the last 20 odd of ministry, I think I would be surprised. It's a chapter that we come back to again and again, and we do so because it's an important chapter which deals with very basic but very important and very serious issues. Very basic questions are asked and answered as we read together this second chapter of Ephesians. What is the Bible all about? What does God want of me? How can I be saved? Why must I be saved? Am I a true Christian? In a whole manner of different ways, all these and more are tackled in these 22 verses. But tonight I'm not going to take a wide sweep in that way, but I'm going to focus in on one rather small aspect of what we have in this whole picture. But an aspect that touches on all of these questions and others besides. Because I wish to focus tonight on what Paul calls God's kindness toward us. God's kindness toward us. And I want to consider with you what Paul means by this kindness toward us. I want to look at the nature and the purpose of this kindness. And in order to examine some of this, I want to look at four separate things with you. I want us to begin this evening by thinking about the details of this kindness that Paul is speaking of in verse 7. The details of this kindness. What kindness is he talking about? What's the background to this kindness that he's speaking about here? Well, from verse 1 of the chapter, from the very opening words, the apostle has been explaining for us what God has done for his people. What Christ has done in his work as Savior. What God the Father has done in his role, what the Spirit too has done in the Spirit's role. Showing the Ephesians, showing us how things were spiritually 
before the Lord ever came into their lives. Remember, he says, and I'm going to have just four simple subheadings here. Remember, first of all, he says, you were spiritually dead. Remember, you were spiritually dead. Now, I drew your attention in our reading in verse 1 that that word quickened means brought to life. Why did they need to be brought to life? Because sin brought spiritual death. Without laboring the point, we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. We find sin coming into the world. In the day that you eat, you will die. Now, Adam and Eve didn't die physically that day. The process of death began in them and eventually the day came when they did die. But spiritually they died. Spiritually they died that day. Sin brings spiritual death. What does that mean in practical terms? Well, it means there's no spiritual life in our souls unless and until God brings and places spiritual life there. You know what it's like maybe when you're, you've planted something in a little pot, some seeds, and you watch and you wait. Now, some of these pots and some of these seeds, they come on and they grow and they do quite well. But there are other pots and they don't. And you look at them and you put a bit more water on them and you think, well, maybe they, they don't have enough sunlight, so I'll move them into the sun. Or maybe I didn't put enough water, I put more water. Maybe I put too much water, I'll, I'll let them dry out a bit. But no matter what you do, nothing ever comes. And eventually, eventually you see something beginning to grow in it and you realize a blade of grass. It's just weeds. There's no life in them. There's nothing in the pot. Well, spiritually, that's how we are by nature. We are like that pot without any spiritual life. There's no saving faith. There's no love to the Lord. We're unable to function spiritually as God would have us function. We simply don't work. There is no life. There is no engine. There is no spiritual breath. Unless and until God gives that to us. But God, says the apostle, if you're a believer, has given you spiritual life. Verse 1, we know verse 1 so well. We can read it with our eyes shut and we run through verse 1. Ah, oh, we should savor verse 1 as we read it. And you, if that's you, what a thing that is. You, you who were spiritually dead, hath he quickened, hath he brought to life? You who were dead in trespasses and sin. You see, being a Christian is much, much more than adopting a certain type of belief. Sometimes you... You get that impression from people, don't you? They, and there's this confusion maybe in their minds. And they say, well, I'm going to follow Christ. Well, you can only follow Christ as he brings you to spiritual life. You are no more able to follow him than somebody who is dead is able to follow me. It would be absurd to say to somebody who was, who was dead, you're going to have to follow him. Well, there's no life there. They, they can't follow. No matter what, they can't follow. It's impossible. Well, spiritually, there's an exact parallel with that. We might speak of following Christ. The first thing we need to do is to have spiritual life worked in us and brought to us so that we can get up and follow him. Being a Christian is much more than adopting a certain type of beliefs. At the very outset, it requires spiritual life. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Somebody put it like this. Man is born spiritually dead. But many, and he means Christians of course, die alive. Isn't that remarkable? Well, the Christian was born dead, but he's going to die alive. There's something of a conundrum, but oh, it's a great kindness. 
This is the kindness he's speaking of. This is the first point. You were spiritually dead, but he brought you to life. What kindness? But then secondly, you were not only spiritually dead, but you were a spiritual failure. The one follows the other, of course. You were a spiritual failure. As you read these verses, we begin to, to realize that in our unconverted days, there was no spiritual purpose, no spiritual direction. It was all aimless. There was no functioning. It's summed up for us in verse 12. That that time you were without God, without Christ. It says at the beginning of the verse, without Christ. It says at the end of the verse, without God and without hope in the world. Without God and without hope. The two go together. But now, now the apostle is saying, there's a new purpose. Now there's new direction. Now there's new fullness. Now there's new order. Just look at verse 6. He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You were spiritually dead. You were a spiritual failure. Thirdly, you were spiritually isolated. You were spiritually isolated. Before you became a Christian, you were far away. As it says in verse 13, Now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were afar off, are made nigh, are, are brought near. Well, what were you far away from? Ah, you were far away from God. That goes without saying. You were far away from God. You were far away from where you should be. You were far away from safety. We think of the prodigal son and in Luke 15. He illustrates this so well. He was far away. But then he repents, doesn't he? He turns from his sinful way. He returns to his father. He seeks his father. The father, as we'll see in a moment, extends great kindness to him. And now he is brought near. He's brought in. The father doesn't say to the prodigal, well, I forgive you and our relationship is mended. Uh, and here are some new clothes. Now go away, please. Go away. Go out of the town. Go some distance away. And, and maybe occasionally you can, you can come and visit. And, and maybe we'll meet together outside the house. No, of course not. Come in. You who are far off. Oh, how far off you were. You were much far off than you realize. You actually thought you were reasonably near because you had Christian parents or Christian friends or family or whatever. And you thought, I'm actually very, very close. But then the Holy Spirit began to work in your soul and you began to see you were far off. And you said, I'm so far off, I'll never be near. I'll never even get within a mile. Oh, what great kindness. You who are far off are near, are in. How does he put it in verse 19? Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're telling me this isn't kindness? You find greater kindness in this? You won't. Ah, the details of this kindness. You were spiritually dead but now you're Life. You were a spiritual failure, but now you're functioning. You were spiritually isolated, but now you're near. Fourthly, you were spiritually hostile. It wasn't even as if you were far away, but in a, in a sort of benign, neutral relationship with God. Your dealings with God were marked by disobedience. Verse 2. Your dealings... With God left you exposed to God's wrath. Verse 3. I don't have time to, to exegete these points just now. But in great kindness you have been reconciled. The enmity has been taken away. The threat of judgment has been taken away. 
laid on Christ, of course. The details of this kindness. Spiritually dead, now alive. Spiritual failure, now functioning. Spiritually isolated, now brought near. Spiritually hostile, now at peace. Peace with God. Do you know what that is? Peace with God. It doesn't mean that everything is rosy and every day is, is easy. It means you have peace with God. You say, yeah, no matter what, I have peace with God through Christ. In life, in death, in whatever. The details of this kindness that Paul is speaking of. But secondly, I want us to look at the basis of this kindness that Paul is speaking of in verse 7. How could God do this? How can he extend this kindness? On what basis does he extend this kindness? What's it all built on? Is there any basis, legal or otherwise? Well, he tells us here the basis for this kindness, verse 7, in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. This kindness comes to us through Christ Jesus. It flows to us, it reaches us through him. It's exercised through Christ and is for his sake. For his sake. Now you might be asked by a friend to do something and you're kind of reluctant to do it for whatever reason. Maybe it's going to inconvenience you. Maybe it's just something you'd rather not do. And you're, you're hesitant. And then the person says, would you do it for my sake? And you say, well, okay, I'll do it for your sake. Because of your, what you mean to me, I will, I will do it for your sake. Well, that's a, a very poor illustration and a very pale but maybe it goes an inch along the way to showing us that everything that reaches us reaches us for Christ's sake. Because of who he is. Because of what he's done. Kindness is extended to those who are his people. They wear what they wear. But it's as if Christ says, for my sake, receive them and show kindness to them for my sake. Joseph brings his brothers and his father into the court of Pharaoh and there's the mighty Pharaoh. And he looks down at this group of Rural shepherds. But he gifts them the best of Egypt. He says, I want you to have Goshen. Why? For Joseph's sake. Because of his standing in the court. Because of who he is and what he is. And everybody in Egypt is left in no doubt. Treat these people well for Joseph's sake. And here's our Joseph. And they are received for Jesus' sake. You see the price that he paid. Taking away the debt that they had. Dealing with the wrath and the enmity of God towards sin 
it all opens up the way for this kindness. And the wonderful thing is that it's done in a way that doesn't violate any of God's attributes. You see, God doesn't pardon sinners by pretending their sin didn't, didn't happen. If he did that, he would be as corrupt as we are. No, he, he extends kindness, but he does it in a way in which his justice and his goodness is not stained at all. That's part of the wonder of the gospel. And we receive this kindness through faith. Now, what's faith? I suppose all of us would, would have a go at defining faith, but what would you say? How would you define it? How would you define it? Well, I, I'm not going to give an exhaustive definition just now, but I'll say this much. It has at least three components. You know the way a machine is, a clock, for instance. That clock up there needs several pieces to work. It needs a battery. It needs hands, obviously, to go around. If it didn't have hands, it'd be no use, supposing it had a battery. It wouldn't tell us the time. And it needs the mechanism that the battery works. Without that, it's no use on it. We need all these parts to make the clock work. Well, faith has at least three components. The first component is knowledge. Faith without knowledge is meaningless. You can't believe in something that you don't know. Knowledge of what? Well, knowledge of our need of Christ and knowledge of Christ's uh, ability to meet us in our need have to know who God is, what God is, what God requires of us, what Christ has done for us. We need to have a knowledge of these things. That's why we preach the word of God, in order that people will know. But all the knowledge in the world is no use if that's the only component we have. Because faith must also have belief. You see, the devils, they have knowledge. Satan has more knowledge than all of us put together. He knows intimately about God. He, he knows his Bible back to front. And he understands the decrees and purposes of God in a way that none of us do. Even in his broken, very limited state, now in his fallen condition. But all that knowledge that he has is of no use. And it will never be of any use. Because you need the component of belief. Belief in what? Well, belief that the Bible is true. You see, knowing the Bible but not embracing it as the truth of God's word is of no use. We have to believe that the Bible is true. We have to believe that Christ is a savior and that what he promises is true. We have to believe it all from beginning to end. We have knowledge, we have belief, but we need a third component. And the third component is trust. Saving faith has trust in it. Because knowing all these things and believing all these things will never save us. You have somebody trapped in a building. They know there is a fire escape. They have knowledge. That's not actually going to do them any good. They have to know the fire escape is there so that if, if they need it, they'll know how to get out. If they don't know it's there, then their situation is, is, is compounded horribly. They have to know there is a fire escape. Secondly, they have to believe that that fire escape actually takes them outside and that it will be able to take them down the stairs and that they can walk in it and that it's really there. But even that belief in itself is of no use if the fire bell goes, if they stay put in their seat. All the knowledge and all the belief and everything they've been told about the fire escape is of no use 
And the fact that that fire escape was kept up to standard and that it ticked every single health and safety box and that it was an excellent fire escape is of no use if they're not actually making their way along and towards that fire escape. Well, so it is with the gospel. Ah, we need knowledge. We need belief. Heart belief that these things are true. But we also need trust. You have to come to Christ. Submitting to his lordship, trusting in him as saviour. We have to put our trust in him and on him. And that's how the kindness reaches us. By the exercise of saving faith. I've got a gift for you in my hand. You might say to a little child, I've got something for you here. And the child is shy and the child is coy. And the child puts both hands behind their back and, and looks to the ground. And you say, do you want it? Do you really want it? There it is. There it is. And, and shyly and slowly, the child's little hand goes out. And takes it. Until the child's hand goes out and takes it, it's not theirs. But as it takes it, it becomes theirs. Now all these illustrations, they're all limited. Extremely. But there's just perhaps enough in them to guide us in this matter. The Puritans used to speak of saving faith as leaning on Christ. What an excellent illustration. Leaning on him. Putting all your weight, all your care, the, the burden of your very soul upon him. Believing that he is able to carry you. Right now I'm leaning on the side of the pulpit here. I'm doing so because I believe it's able to, to support me. If I, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be doing it. And if I were to lean on that side, without that clip on the door, it would swing open a bit. But there's no door here, there's no clip here. This is a fixed feature. I'm leaning on it. I'm doing that, believing it's able to support me. I'm exercising faith in it. Perhaps even better, the Puritans used to speak of Christ as if, as if you were lying flat on a rock and putting all your, your weight and burden on it. Sometimes they would speak of the limpet as it clung to the rock, clinging to it. You know the way the limpet, you know the way these sea creatures are, they just cling to the rock. And along comes the wave and they cling to the rock. That rock keeps them. Now the limpet doesn't know much about the rock. The limpet knows zero about geology. The limpet knows nothing about tides and why tides happen. It's found a rock. And the Christian is like this. They don't understand the ocean of God's dealings and, and the character of it, but they have found a rock. And they've come to the place where they cling to the rock, where they rest on Christ alone. Nothing else. Nothing else. That's their hope. For time and for eternity. The illustration is used as well of the blind person and the guide. You can imagine somebody who's blind and they've got a, somebody's going to guide them. Or maybe they've got a new guide dog. Well, the first day, they're probably a bit shaky and uncertain about the guide or the guide dog. 
But every day, the trust grows. You know, that guide might let you down. And that guide dog might just get it wrong. Christ won't, Christ can't. The exercise of faith. Ah, but you say, you're saying this to me just now, you're thinking this. That's all very well. But I have a problem. And here's my problem. I have tried to exercise faith. I've tried and tried, but I can't. And you're saying to me, he's going to dismiss my problem just now. Well, I'm not. I sympathize with where you are. I understand exactly where you are, actually. Because I've been there. But you are forgetting something. That faith is the gift of God. It's defined for us in the Bible, not as something that we conjure up, not as something that we manufacture in our own hearts. And we think, well, I didn't manufacture a working model. I'll have to try again to manufacture faith. And we don't have the prototype yet. He does. It's not a question of you creating faith. It's a question of God working faith in you. And bringing you to trust. And if that is your problem, and it, it, it's, it's a real problem, I'm not dismissing it for one second. What you need to do is not try again to create faith, but to go to the Lord. And acknowledge before him your complete failure, and, and you, you'll always be a complete failure to create faith. But to work faith in you. And to bring you to that place where you are resting in him and trusting him. The details of this kindness that Paul is speaking of. The, the basis of this kindness that Paul is speaking of. Thirdly, the extent of this kindness that Paul is speaking of in verse 7. You see how Paul describes it in verse 7. He describes it as rich kindness. Rich kindness. In other words, it's not small. It's not half-hearted. It won't, it won't run out. It's a rich kindness. You know, sometimes there's different types of kindness. There's little kindnesses. And they're welcome and they're good. But they're small. And they're limited. You know, to go back to the blind person. There's the blind person, and, or maybe partially sighted. And they're, they're standing by the side of the road. They need to get across the road. And along comes somebody, and they, they say, excuse me, would you help me across the road? And this person takes them and takes them across the road. That is a kindness. But that person isn't going to be there next week. On the next junction. It's, it's limited that kindness. But when we think of this kindness. We realize that it's, it's, it's far reaching. It's, it's constant. It's inexhaustible in its riches. The riches of God's grace. And by using the word rich. The apostle is reminding us. That it's valuable and it's precious. It's rich kindness. But that's not enough. Look at the verse. He says, exceeding riches. Exceeding riches. It's not just rich kindness. It's exceedingly rich kindness. What does it exceed? It exceeds at least three things. It exceeds, first of all, what you deserve. Oh, you say you're being too hard. Well, look at the previous verses. Have we seen already spiritual death and so on? It exceeds what you deserve. It exceeds what you expect. Remember the prodigal. The best hope that he had was to be a, a servant on the lowest grade in the family. That was the best hope he cherished. 
one of the hired servants. Now the hired servants were the lowest of the low. The daily hired, those who had no security, little privilege, little benefit. They got in, they got their day's wages, and that was all they had. That's all he expects. He says, if I can get that, I'm a happy man. See, God doesn't just forgive his people all their sins for Christ's sake. He raises them up, as we see in the previous verses, to the say, to share that place with Christ that he occupies in heavenly splendor. They become joint heirs with Christ. Did you expect that? It exceeds what you deserve. It exceeds what you expect. And it exceeds what you understand. What do I mean? I mean simply this. I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither hath it entered into the heart of man. What God hath prepared for them that love. And it exceeds everything else. It's everlasting. It's incorruptible. You know we leave everything else. Supposing you found a treasure trove. Supposing you stumbled across a treasure trove this week. You're out digging maybe or somebody else is out digging in the garden or on the cross. Or they stumble across some old papers in a box in the attic or wherever. And it's, it's a fortune. Absolute fortune. Millions. Let's say it's worth millions. Let's say it's worth a billion. We can't even begin to comprehend what that might mean. But let's suppose that it, it reaches that. And you would have it for a time. You would live off it. But you don't need me to tell you that nothing lasts for long here. But this riches, this is eternal and everlasting and incorruptible, that fadeth not away, says Jesus himself. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where it doesn't fade away. Oh, this, should, this is astonishing. The details of this kindness, the basis of this kindness, the extent of this kindness, finally, in a word, the results of this kindness. That Paul is speaking of in verse 7. Verse 7 again. That in the ages to come. He might show the exceeding riches. Of his grace. In his kindness. To us. What's the result? Well the ultimate result is that God is glorified. His saved people. Are to be an exhibition to the whole creation. Of his wisdom and his love and his grace in Christ. Now there's not many tonight who see this. If we were to do a straw poll of society in general. And ask them about the kindness of God through Christ. And ask them to tell us about it. You wouldn't fill the back of an envelope. But there's a day coming when every eye will see it. And when they will see God's saving work in all its beauty and in all its success. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Some will do it gladly. Some will do it unwillingly. But they'll all acknowledge it. This is the purpose of it all. The good of those who trust in Christ. And the glory of God. And the two meet together. In one. The story is told of a well-to-do woman in the days of the Roman Empire. And she had visitors one day. They, they knew her well enough to go bold be. 
And they said, why don't you show us some of your jewels? All right, she said. She called her children. It's not what the visitors expected. What does the Lord class us as jewels? His people. They shall be mine, he says, in that day when I make up my jewels. In the ages to come. That's a way of speaking about eternity itself. Because only eternity will reveal the length and the breadth of this kindness that I've spoken of here tonight. I'm finished. But here's the question. How do you respond to all this kindness? For some it's thankfulness and joy as they think of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For others, it's just dismissed and life goes on as before. What a tragedy. If we miss the kindness, if we bypass it, if we walk away from it, It speaks in the earlier verses of Christ being super exalted. Well, so are his people. In this supreme demonstration of his grace. The exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness. Christian, here's encouragement for you. In his kindness. His kindness is not a one-off. He shows nothing but kindness. He can only act kind. And that means that he is for you even when it feels as though he's against you. But it's an encouragement to everyone to come because of his kindness. Because of his kindness you can come. And taste of his kindness. And if you have tasted of his kindness, are you be sure to let others know? Because if you've tasted of his kindness, you're like a beggar who's found a source of bread. Don't keep it to yourself. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Give thanks, O Lord, for this great kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to appreciate it, to magnify it, bring us to saving faith, to resting in Christ, and not on anything else. Pardon us our sin now, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing... We're going to sing in Psalm 107. We're going to sing the first two verses and then the last three. Well, when I say the first two, I mean the stanzas marked one to four there. Psalm 107, reading at verse one. Praise God for he is good, for still his mercies lasting be. Let God's redeemed say so, whom he from the enemy's hand did free, and gathered them out of the lands from north, south, east, and west. They strayed in deserts, pathless way, no city found to rest. Then at verse um, 41, Yet setteth he the poor on high from all his miseries, and he, much like unto a flock, doth make him families. They that are righteous shall rejoice, when they the same shall see. And as ashamed, stop our mouth, shall all iniquity. Whoso is wise, and will these things observe and them recall, even they, look at this, even they shall understand the love and kindness of the Lord. The first two, the last three, praise God, for he is good.
Very simply, God willing, the denomination, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest on and remain with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>